Thank you for coming today and we're really happy to have you here because after our three year journey we finally get to interview you to see how you uncovered all the um, mystery of the mill. Oh, it's good to be here Lydia and thank you. Okay, so um, we wanted to start today by finding out how you actually uncovered the Battle of Fromel and it's immediately piqued your interest because many people don't actually know about the battle. Uh, there wasn't much written. I didn't know, I had an interest in military history and through our group, the Friends of the 15th Brigade, uh, I would uh, do as much reading as I could and uh, we eventually set up uh, an association and we would uh, research, but we didn't really know much about the Battle of Fromel. Mm -hmm. And there was one reference in a book by uh, Peter Charlton on Pozier, and there was one paragraph. I'd never heard of the Battle of Fromel. Mm -hmm. So having read that paragraph, I tried to learn as much as I possibly could and travel around to meet veterans of that battle. Mm -hmm. And it was my, uh, I consider myself very fortunate to share the company and the companionship mm -hmm. of the 19th of July men, the survivors of the Battle of Fromel. Uh, men like uh, Bill Boyce and Tom Brain, Charlie Henderson, so uh, I would travel around and just sit and talk and get background provenance, but it was always, as I said, my privilege to share the company with these men. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So um, when you first visited Fromel in 1996, what did you discover? Uh, I thought I always wanted to go to Fromel, mm -hmm. having done some reading, and uh, to be there on the anniversary of the battle, the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Fromel. So I went over and uh, I'd made a really good link with a local historian, Marcel Delavar. Mm -hmm. uh, he works for the Commonwealth Law Graves Commission. And um, so I wanted to be in from on the anniversary of the battle. So uh, he and I went out to the battlefield and, and walked it. We walked the length of the battlefield, but uh, it was significant to be there on the actual date of the battle and to walk the ground. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So then how did you first discover that there were men still missing from battle and were not accounted for? Yeah. Uh, all of this from my is down to author, historian, friend, founder of the Friends of the 15th Brigade, Robin Caulfield. Mm -hmm. He began the research, a research for a book called Don't Forget Me Cobber in the year 2000. And in his research, he happened to choose one particular soldier, uh, Jack Bowden of the 59th Battalion, and in his record, there was a reference to a place called Pheasant Wood. Mm -hmm. None of us knew where or what a Pheasant Wood was, uh, but in his file, the only one in all 1,332 records of the missing of the Battle of Fromel was that reference to Pheasant Wood. So that was the first um, reference that we'd found. When I went over again in 2002, I went there with the question, where is Pheasant Wood? So, uh, None of us knew anything at all about Pheasant Wood. How did you then um, find out where the mass graves actually were? Yeah, went there in 2002, walked the ground, went there with the question, where is Pheasant Wood? I asked Martial, where is Pheasant Wood? And he said, somewhere up there. So when we got back, uh, we did the research. Uh, we contacted uh, the Imperial War Museum in London looking for anomalies behind the German line. Mm -hmm. Because there were many missing from the Battle of Fromel, but there were the unaccounted for missing. That is, those who got into and beyond the German line were killed uh, and taken back. There's a, a photograph of soldiers on a train, being a light rail, being taken back somewhere behind the German line. So we thought that surely there should be a burial site of unaccounted for missing Australians behind the German line. And in Jack Bowden's file, it said that he could be buried in one of five pits mm -hmm. before Pheasant Wood. So we got the aerial photographs, looking for anomalies, and at this particular spot, there were photographs pre and post battle. That was a critical point. So we had photographs of the proposed site uh, before the Battle of Fromel, and there was no digging at all. Then 10 days after the, after the battle, there was clear evidence of sustained earthwork and digging. And this was our proposition that somewhere that somewhere was uh, before Pheasant Wood. So we had the aerial photographs, then we went on to, to do other research to try and find the unaccounted for missing. But these photographs strongly suggested that a particular ground before this particular wood was of interest. Okay, very interesting. So as you gathered your evidence, you obviously wanted to like, um, 
uh, you obviously wanted to find out exactly where they were and restore their dignity and give closure to the families. How did you end up actually um, convincing the Australian government to um, uh, believe your discoveries? <laughs> it's been a, quite a journey and uh, there was a network mm -hmm. uh, of support and we put forward that proposition. I met Ward Selby in Fromell and he was the grandson of someone who survived the battle and John Fielding, so Lord Selby, John Fielding and I, we commenced that research and we advocated. It's like we were being fobbed off, mm -hmm. but I mean, uh, there was active discouragement. But at this point, I would like to thank the Australian Army mm -hmm. for having established a process which eventually brought us to uh, investigation, confirmation and recovery. But there was a long journey before then. Uh, we went to the press because we were being fobbed off and uh, we gained support and eventually we were invited to Canberra in 2005 to make our case to an expert panel mm -hmm. of military historians and uh, researchers and the like, uh, military, and uh, we made our case to them and uh, opinions varied as to the strength of our particular case. But with the aerial photographs and then going through the Red Cross wounded and missing files, mm -hmm. uh, we gathered a list of soldiers because what happened was when they got over uh, the Germans were gathering the bodies they took the ID discs off the bodies those who had them and recorded their names so in the end there was a working list of missing unaccounted for missing mm -hmm. but accounted for by the Germans because they took their discs off recorded their names and buried them so um, we put forward the aerial photographs the list of those that had been gathered and buried and we made our case, opinions varied as to the strength of that case. Some of them said that they were gun pits, but I couldn't see how why they'd been gun pits. Not just with hindsight, I was always confident that they were there, but there was some anxiety. We went away, continued that process, and eventually in 2006, 60 Minutes did a story on it, so I put it well and truly on the public agenda, and people were asking questions, why don't you go there and investigate? Mm -hmm. But. Uh, We'd made that case and finally a German document was found in the Munich archives dated two days after the battle and we just said you will dig before Pheasant Wood for 400. Ah. So there was no more invasive smoke. The ground had been used for burial purposes. The Germans had dug eight pits and they filled in five. And in Jack Bowden's file said he could be buried in one of five pits dug before Pheasant Wood. So it is absolute chance and serendipity, a lovely word serendipity, mm -hmm. But it is absolute chance that Robin chose him to profile. It's his file, the only one that mentions Pheasant Wood, and we asked that question and we followed through. Okay. So eventually, given uh, the German document, um, the Australian government engaged Tony Pollard and his team from Glasgow University to go there and do a non-invasive investigation of the site in 2007. So they went to Pheasant Wood and uh, they cleared the ground because it's used for adjustment. The uh, grass is really high and the farmer cuts it. No one knew mm -hmm. what was there. And our good friend Patrick Lindsay, mm -hmm. um, he wrote a book on it, also helped it, you know, uh, propel the, the project. Uh, he found the landowners, because we were always a bit anxious about what was going to happen with the landowners be sympathetic. Mm -hmm. But uh, Patrick went over, he found the landowners, Madame uh, Monsieur de Massier, and uh, they were sympathetic. Madame de Massey had lost two uncles in the Great War, one of whom was missing. So they gave their permission for their land to be investigated. Okay. And uh, she said, we always wondered about that particular land, because nothing ever grew there, nothing at all. They tried to plant vegetables there, but they never ever grew. Uh, and all that ever grew there were these strange little blue flowers. So the, no one had an idea about what might be there, but the momentum was such that they finally engaged Tony Pollard to go there with very clever technology using sophisticated metal detectors and ground penetrating radar to investigate the ground. They weren't allowed to dig, mm -hmm. just uh, use that clever technology. They could dig to a shovel's depth only, but uh, they found lots of junk, bullets, shrapnel balls and the like. But they also found two distinctly Australian items. One was a heart-shaped medallion with Anzac mm -hmm. written on it. And the other one was from the Shire of Alberton. Now, a member of our team of research and advocacy, Tim Mifford, uh, we've been doing that research and advocating for a really long time, and it's remarkable. 
absolutely remarkable that this, these two items come out of the ground and one of them belongs to his great uncle, Harry Willis, who came from Alberton. So the, the village, the township, gave him the medallion, the Shire of Alberton, and this thing comes out of the ground in their non-invasive investigation of the shovel's depth only. So it strongly suggested that the ground was of particular interest because no Australian soldiers got that far that night mm -hmm. or throughout the entire duration of the war that ground had never ever been fought over. So the only way they could have got there were the bodies of dead Australians. Mm -hmm. So um, Tony did that work, went away, did all the clever science and reported back to the army uh, to suggest that the ground was of interest and the public swing was such that, you know, given what we have now, are you going to go back and investigate? And again, I thank the Army for having established and maintained that process, which eventually got us there. So in 2008, mm -hmm. Tony Pollard was re-engaged to go back and actually dig. So uh, I went over again to Fremel to be there for that dig. Uh, as I said, I was confident they were there, but there mm -hmm. was that anxiety. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were finally there to, to determine three things. Was it a burial site? What condition were the bodies in? And if possible, to get an idea of the numbers. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what they were there doing. And very late on the second night, uh, Tim and I, uh, well, we were, there was an area they broke it off. You know, we weren't allowed on site. But uh, we went over there to dig. But we could have been helpful. But um, on the first night, we were taken on site to view what they had done. Because they removed the topsoil. Mm -hmm. There's about a metre of topsoil before they got down to the original level. And Tim and I were invited on site at the end of the first night. And we could see the absolute pencil line straightness of the edges of the pits and the difference in the colour of the clay, oh. suggesting that anything that was buried there was still there because mm -hmm. the ground had not been disturbed. Sure, they were buried there, but they might have been recovered post but There was never any documentation to suggest that they were. So we were confident, anxious but confident, mm -hmm. that the ground was burial. Then late on the second night, uh, Paola Tataro, a top journalist, you can Google her articles, mm -hmm. she said, I reckon they found something. There was a lot of hushed conversations in the corner of the compound and uh, a lot of talking and photographing taking place and they left the site. The following morning they come back and make the official announcement because the previous night, the first sign of human remains. It was an, it was an arm coming out of the ground, uh, minus its hand. So the site was intact. Anything buried there was still there. And uh, then they would go and dig deeper. And um, they were there for three weeks. Wow. Yes, it was a burial site. The bodies were in inverted commas, in good condition, because as, as they had been placed into the pits or thrown in, um, the tight, tight clay of pheasant wood had held them in place. And they could only make a guesstimate as to the numbers that were buried there. So what they did, they covered the site over to await a political determination as to how they were going to proceed. What were they going to do? Mm -hmm. Were they going to bury them, which is effectively what they did, recover them and put up a monument saying, believed to be buried here, Australians of the 5th Division, British of the 61st Division, killed on the 19th or 20th of July, or would they recover the site? We advocated very strongly that they should recover. It all, it all goes back to the original question. Do you do this kind of work? I believe you should. I believe you have that moral obligation to find and recover our war dead. Mm -hmm. So there they were. Had we left them like that, it would have sent a really bad message to our current serving people. Mm -hmm. So the Australian Army drove this process and eventually the decision was made to go back and recover the site. Okay. So uh, as I said, there was some quick relief, but that was overtaken by hope. The hope that they would go back, recover these men, restore their dignity and perhaps their identity because after all we knew who at least 196 of them were by name because the Germans told us who they buried there. So uh, they went back. Uh, the work of recovery went to Oxford Archaeology and in 2009 they went there and recovered the site. They recovered 250 soldiers from, the, from those pits because uh, um, they dug eight pits the document said, dig for 400, dug eight pits, filled in five, 250 recovered. And um, after they recovered them, they went about trying to identify mm -hmm. the soldiers. So they built a new cemetery, because that 
the original sites at the bottom of the slope and prone to flooding. So they recovered the soldiers. Uh, they found remarkable things. So DNA was going to be the main provider of uh, identity, but also they found, oh, like they found uh, watches uh, with oh. names on them. Three soldiers still had their discs on, so they were immediately identifiable. Many uh, poignant articles. They found uh, a train ticket in the waterproof section of a gas mask dated wow. and uh, returned second class free metal to Perth, clearly placed there by that soldier as a good luck charm, mm -hmm. a talisman. And um, they found other items uh, which would give the identity of soldiers, uh, a Bible with underlined sections through it and uh, other documents uh, and items. So they were using these things to try and identify the soldiers but it was always going to be DNA. Yeah. Then in 2010, they held one soldier over for ceremonial burial on the anniversary of the battle and the dedication of the new cemetery. And on July 19, uh, 2010, uh, he was brought in mm -hmm. and uh, reunited with the soldiers of Pheasant Wood. And uh, at that stage, 96 Australian soldiers had been identified. That figure is now 166. Identifying one was wonderful, yeah. but 166 is, is really quite remarkable. And that process of identification will continue because mm -hmm. uh, they are gathering DNA from across Australia and around the world to try and match these soldiers using DNA and restoring their names. So when they do get one, they'll change the headstone from an unknown soldier to the identity of the soldier. So uh, it's been a long process. Yeah. With a, with a wonderful result and a good team effort with that wonderful result. And uh, there are many, many links. The Framel family is broad and growing. We have very good friends in mm. Framel. Myself, Delapar, I have very good friends, Pierre Sevier, successive mayors and the village. They know what happened on their land. None of us knew where Fethenwood was, but we asked a question and we followed through. Mm. And now we have this site, this cemetery, where people can go and make their pilgrimage. So dignity and identity for the soldiers of Pheasant Wood and those to come. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to add about the outcome of the missing soldiers? Well, just that I believe that we've got to make every effort we can yeah. to find and recover our war dead. There's ongoing work in Frommel yeah. because I believe that all of the bearers of Pheasant Wood are Australian, mm -hmm. no British. We might have found those British somewhere else, very close to the village, and also from the previous year's battle, but the British government will not investigate. Mm -hmm. Uh, confident that we've found other burial sites, but there are more Australian sites across France and Belgium, and that work will continue. And now we have a group in Canberra, the UWCA, and if you can make a strong enough case, uh, they will investigate. But COVID, as you very well know, it's mm -hmm. such a disappointment you didn't get to go and make your pilgrimage to greet your soldier. But uh, they will investigate if you can make a strong enough case. So there is ongoing work, and the answer to my own question is that. It's work that we should do. Mm -hmm. There can't be a logistical or a financial inconvenience. You've got to go and make that effort to find and recover your war dead. Mm -hmm. So there is ongoing work yeah. for uh, UWCA and St Clair's. Because mm -hmm. uh, it's been remarkable to know that uh, you're doing this work yes. and to know that uh, commemoration and remembrance is in good, useful hands. Mm -hmm. So it will be sustained. And you've gone along to Hyde Park Memorial uh, to be part of the services there. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's important that we commemorate, we honour the service and the sacrifice, not only those who went away to war and remain in foreign fields, but also uh, the families at home who had to endure it. And through your work, you've met those families, you've met your soldiers. So it becomes very personal. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ben, and most importantly, thank you for going through that, your pursuit of finding and uncovering the fates of the missing soldiers and most importantly bringing closure to their families. I mean, we've been so honoured to actually take part in just a little bit of documenting your discoveries. Thank you Lily and uh, ongoing work. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's been a journey with a wonderful result. Yes. Dignity and identity for the soldiers of Heaven Wood and now the growing from our family. Mm -hmm. And thank you Robin Caulfield. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you Lily. Thanks for coming. Thanks guys, good job. Yeah. Good job.